Uh, welcome online, connecting friends. I'm going to pray. Let's ask for God's help as we look at this last section in 1 Corinthians. Father God, thank you so much that you are a speaking God and that we can know you through your word. We thank you for this time that we have together now. Would you open the eyes of our minds that we may see wonderful things in your word. Uh, May uh, my words and all of our thoughts be pleasing in your sight. Our God, our rock, and our redeemer. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you've seen these books before, friends. Uh, this one's called 1001 Movies to See Before You Die. Uh, I think there's a tight picture up on the slide. Um, there are different sorts of these books. There's uh, 1001 books to read before you die, 1001 songs to listen to before you die. It's a, it's a thick book. There's a lot of movies to see. But actually, when I, when I see these books, and this one I've just borrowed from Auburn Library up the road for the purpose of this illustration, uh, when I see these books, I actually feel very sad. And it's not because I don't love a good movie. I do. I love movies. I love reading books. I love listening to songs. But it's the title, 1001 Movies to See Before You Die. I'm saddened by the worldview in that title. It's the idea that death is coming and death is the end, so life is about here and now. In that title is the worldview that we've just got to fill up our lives with the best experiences that we can and the most pleasure that we can find quickly before life runs out. In other words, I've got whatever time that I've got I better get seeing good movies. I better get reading good books because then I die and it's all over. It's the tragic worldview of those who don't believe in the resurrection. The worldview that was seeping into the Corinthian church. The philosophy that Paul referred to in the last chapter, chapter 15, verse 33, the philosophy of our world and of these books. If the dead are not raised... Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. It's exactly what this book is saying. The dead aren't raised, so let's watch the best movies that we can and read the best books that we can, because then we die, and we've lost our chance. But friends, we know that the dead are raised, because Jesus Christ, the firstfruits, has been raised. So we who are in Christ will be raised with Christ bodily when he returns. And that changes everything. Life no longer is about my bucket list. It doesn't center on me and all that I can experience and enjoy before time runs out. No, that is not what my life is about because I don't just run out of time. As we sing sometimes... One with himself, Christ, I cannot die. And my life now and and your life now, it's not about us. It's about Christ. Christ, our risen Savior. That's what life is about. And friends, that's what this final chapter is about that Rachel just read. Friends, we know that we can be tempted to skip over the concluding chapters in Paul's letters. It seems like there's lots of personal details and travel plans and specific instructions, and we think, what is there in that for me? There's no learning to be done here. But friends, no. This final chapter reveals Paul's worldview, his way of looking at life now. It's a, bit, a little bit like Paul's bucket list Not of movies to see before you die, but of how to live knowing that Jesus is raised and we will be too. Paul's worldview is on display. His resurrection worldview is on display. The heading of the chapter is the last verse of the last chapter that we saw last week. I'm going to read it again because all of chapter 16 flows out of this verse. So the last verse of chapter 15, 1558, which is looking back into the whole of that chapter, therefore, 
That is, because Christ has been raised and we will be too, how should we live? Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That is how to live now. Live fully for the risen Lord Jesus. And this chapter shows us how. I'm not going to go through it verse by verse. There are lots of details. I just want to see some principles of how a resurrection worldview shapes our priorities. We'll look at how it's done that for Paul, and we'll think about how it does it for us. To kick off, Paul gets really practical. He talks about money. He talks about giving money to Christians in need. Now, just relax for a moment, friends. I'm not going to just tell you to give more money to church. That's not what I want to do. Paul's not doing that with the Corinthians, and I'm not going to do that with us. But Paul does reveal some simple practices around giving that, again, flow from a resurrection worldview. Uh, Look at it again, just verses 1 to 3. Now, about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem was in financial trouble. Paul knows the Corinthians will want to help. But he wants them to be intentional about it, to plan the amount they give and to then set it aside week by week so it's ready. That makes sense to us, doesn't it? We had some visitors to our Newington church a couple of weeks ago. Uh, They were asking why we don't pass the plate around each week and have someone get up and urge the congregation to give lots of money. It's a good question. Same practice here at Auburn. We don't do that here either. Why not? Well, it's because of this passage. See, Paul wants the Corinthians to plan their giving. If, if, if we just stick our hand into our pocket or wallet or handbag at church on a Sunday because of some appeal up the front, it's likely that we'll be giving spare change. But God doesn't deserve our spare change, does he? We want to give as much as we can to the cause of the gospel, the gospel that has saved us and that can save others. Friends, this is resurrection thinking. It changes what we do with our money. It changes how we think about giving our money away and because giving to this cause is such a joy, we will plan it out. We'll be, we'll be disciplined and organized because we wouldn't want to miss that privilege. See how the resurrection completely changes? how we think about life. Here's another 1001 book that I saw. Look at this one. 1001 experience, escapes to experience before you die. Right? Holidays. 1001 holidays, basically. And there's some really lovely things in there. You're advised to go and enjoy a sun-drenched Caribbean island or a cruise on the Nile River. Now, again, friends... Wonderful things to do. I love holidays. I hope you do too. I'm not being negative about holidays. Hear me right. What I'm saying is that that's not what life is about. Life is not about us spending our money on the best holidays we can before we die. We don't think like that anymore. Jesus is alive. And all who are connected to Jesus will be raised as well So I'm going to send my money there first. And like Paul, uh, with his address to the Corinthians here, we hear that some Christian brothers or sisters are in need in some other church. We'd love to send some money to help. If we learn that some family are becoming overseas Christian missionaries, taking the gospel to some other country... Well, we're more interested in the gospel going overseas than we are 
ourselves going overseas on holidays, so of course we'll send money to help. If we hear that, that our church wants to add to our staff team so that more people can, can hear about Jesus and, and be led in Christ, of course we'll give. None of this is wasting our money. This is just wise financial management. This is putting our money, which won't last, into something that will last. People. People who will be raised with Christ. The resurrection changes everything, friends. Secondly, we'll prioritize ministry, the work of the Lord. Paul does this. Paul loves the Corinthians. He wants to see the Corinthians. He wants to stay with the Corinthians. But he can't do it just at the moment. Why not? He's got ministry to do, the work of the Lord. Verse 8, but I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost... Because a great door for effective work has opened to me. Remember what this work is, friends? It's sharing Christ. Sharing Christ with people both lost and found. Seeing the lost saved and seeing the saved grown. That's what Paul is involved in. This work that happens through prophecy. Speaking the message of the gospel so that the church is built up. This is the work that lasts. This is the work to prioritize. What was this open door for effective ministry in Ephesus that Paul is talking about that that had him excited and, and delaying his visit to Corinth? He talks about it in Acts. Paul ministered there for two years with the purpose that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And the result of this was that the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honour. And as he did this work, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Wow, that is exciting, isn't it, friends? That's worth prioritising, this kind of work. This is worth changing your plans for, to be involved in and to support this kind of work. Again, friends... I am not telling us to give up our day job and become an overseas missionary in Somalia. I'm not telling us to do that, although for some of us that might be a wise thing to do from this passage. But what I am saying is that we have to let the direction of Jesus shape us, influence us. Now that Jesus is alive and building his church, we want to get on board. We want to play our part and help No longer do we spend our lives just living for this world. Life isn't about seeing the best movies we can or having the best holidays that we can as we count down the days until we die. That that was our old life. When Jesus comes back, that will look completely foolish. No, friends, my agenda is now Jesus' agenda. Get involved in his work. Now, you are doing this, friends, and I could pick on many. Let me just choose some. Think of the leaders of our parkour Friday night youth group, some some of whom come from this congregation, uh, some from our Newington congregation. There are eight leaders. Uh, The staff of our church have invited eight leaders to lead Friday night youth ministry, uh, teaching the youth uh, across our church's congregations. I think Friday night is probably the hardest night to do ministry. Who wants to do any work on a Friday night? Don't we all just want to collapse on the couch on a Friday night? Netflix, perhaps, right? But these leaders have given up their Friday nights week in and week out to teach young people about Jesus. Why on earth would you do that? Well, Jesus is risen from the dead. This is a brilliant spend your Friday night. Youth group leaders, thank you. We all thank you. And if it's not clear now that that has been a wise decision, it will be crystal clear when Jesus returns. And the youth that you are teaching, they will be eternally grateful, and you will be eternally honoured. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything, friends. 
It's not just what we do, though. It's who we are. And so godliness matters. There's a couple of verses that stand out in this section because there are a bunch of commands and they come at us like machine gun fire. Paul knows the Christian life isn't easy and that what matters is finishing. And he wants the Corinthians to finish, even though it's not easy. So look at verses 13 and 14. 13 and 14. Here are, these are a great couple of memory verses, friends. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Do everything in love. They're to be strong and watchful. Why? There are enemies about. The world, the flesh, and the devil. 1 Corinthians has spoken about all of these enemies. Worldly values that have seeped into the Corinthian church. Selfishness. Divisions. Fighting with each other. There's the sinful desires of the flesh. Sinful immorality that a number of the Corinthians had fallen into. The devil's mission, the devil prowls around us, seeking to destroy families, destroy churches, and destroy Christians. We need to be on guard, watchful, courageous. Friends, the Christian life takes courage. It is not for the cowardly. In fact, Revelation warns that the cowardly will miss out. We're to be strong. But not just strong, we're to be people of love. As Hugh reminded us, love is essential. Chapter 13 taught us that. Without love, nothing we do is of any lasting value. We're to be people of strength and love. Just like Jesus, who used his strength, his authority, not to hurt but to serve when he laid down his life as a ransom for many on the cross. We are to be people of strength and love, just like Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything, friends. And finally, friends, we're to serve Christ together. Not on our own, but together, in partnership, in friendship. And the passage is full of references to partnerships to people that worked with. Paul had a number of Christian friends with whom he ministered. You see, he wasn't trying to build, him, build for himself a name as some kind of hero in ministry. He's trying to build Christ's name. And Paul knows that a team will do that better than an individual. Teams are incredibly powerful, aren't they? Think of what a team can do. I saw a great example of this uh, in the news a few years back in Perth. A man um, fell, his legs slipped down between the train and the platform. Look at that. That's a frightening place to be, right? You can imagine what what's about to happen. The train is about to pull out from the platform. Very dangerous. Immediately, the crowd realized what had happened, and they did this. They gathered together. Next slide. And they, they pushed the train, they tilted the train onto its side, and the man was freed. What a beautiful example of teamwork. No one person could save that guy by themselves, could they? That needed a team. Teams are powerful. And friends, it's the same in ministry. Paul operated in ministry partnerships, networks, teams, friendships, just in this letter, he mentions Timothy, Apollos, Stephanus, Fortunatus, Achaeus, Aquila, and Pris Priscilla. He speaks of churches in Ephesus, Galatia, Achaia, Asia, and the church in Corinth. That's just this chapter. Go to Romans 16 for another 35 names of people that Paul worked with. I think in the New Testament, there's more than 100 people that Paul names who are partners in the gospel. Here is a man connected to others for the cause of Christ. And friends, if we're living for the resurrection of Jesus, we'll do the same. We will partner with others who are living for the resurrection of Jesus. We'll want to help them. 
and we'll be happy to benefit from their help to us. That's why it's a joy, isn't it, in our church to partner with our overseas Christian missionaries. They're living for the resurrection of Jesus. And so are we. So we'll support them with our prayers, our giving, our personal friendship and encouragement. Friends, the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. So let me ask us, how is the resurrection shaping our lives? That is what I want you to reflect on, friends. How is the resurrection of Jesus, that worldview, that true and correct worldview, how is that shaping your life, your decisions, your priorities, the kind of things that matter to you, the way you're spending your days? If it is, if the resurrection of Jesus is shaping your life, you'll read a chapter like this in the Bible and it will just make sense. You'll just find yourself nodding as you read it, agreeing. Giving to gospel work and encouragement to give money to gospel work? Yes. Doing ministry as much as we can? Yes. Seeking to be like Jesus and to live lives of courage and love? Yes, partnering with anyone that we can find for the cause of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, life will not be about filling up our time with pleasures and experiences and movies and holidays, as good as all those things are. Life will not be about those things and experiencing them until we die. No, life is about Christ and living for him who lived and died and rose again for us. Let me close with a short story about a man who got this. A man who was a very clever and very athletic and very successful man. Uh, an Englishman called C.T. Studd. He was a medical student at Cambridge University in England and he was a great sportsman. A cricketer who played cricket for the English national team. But C.T. Studd heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and he was powerfully converted. And so he gave up the things of this world and lived instead for Jesus and Jesus' people. He lived as an overseas missionary. He served in China initially, but also Africa and India. C.T. Studd knew that Christ was risen and returning, and he was determined to fill up his life, living not for himself, but living for Christ. And he wrote a poem about his aim in life, which I think is pretty similar to Paul's aim in life. His worldview, C.T. Studd's worldview, is pretty close to Paul's, I think, uh, in Corinthians 16. I'm going to read it, friends. As I notice, it's quite different to the worldview of seeing 1,001 movies before you die. Have a listen, it's about three verses. I'll close with this, then I'll pray. Two little lines I heard one day, travelling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn, and from the world now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bring thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life twill soon be past, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say twas worth it all. Only one life, twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I am dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee.
Let's pray together, friends. Please join me. Father God, we do thank you for this chapter of your word. We thank you that Paul's heart is on display as he lives not for himself, but for Christ, who is raised. And we pray that that would be the case for us. Father, help us to see that reality of the Easter message. And may it shape us in every way. May it shape how we think about money, ministry, time, godliness, friendships, and even life itself. Do protect us from the temptation to live for ourselves in this good world, even as we enjoy your good gifts. Help us to live first for Christ, to spend our days, our time, our energy, our money, our gifts, living not for ourselves, but for Christ. For Christ, who for our sake died and was raised. So we thank you again for our Saviour Jesus. May we rejoice to remember him this Easter and continue to shape us into his likeness. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.